Comic Boom. Hey guys, Comic Boom here to review Deceased Unkillables number three. Finally, I get to review a comic book and a, and a new comic book that came out this week. Fantastic. And I got the I got the variant cover. It sort of reminds me a little bit. I think that reminds me a little bit of Suicide Squad, that cover, or even the movie Harley Quinn, or is it the movie Suicide Squad? Anyways, great alternate cover. Uh, there's, a, there's a third one as well with uh, Deadshot on it. Uh, pretty cool looking, but I just got these two. These were my favorite. Wow, and Undead Wonder Woman, you know, taking on Red Hood. Wow. Deceased Unkillables number three. Guys, this is the road trip from hell. That's how Tom, writer Tom Taylor described it. This this final issue of Deceased Unkillables number three uh, was amazing. It, it consists of uh, one Batmobile, two buses, 41 children, six supervillains, three anti-heroes, one actual hero, one police commissioner, and one dog. Those are all the players. Now, those are all the players in this comic, and incredibly enough, Tom Taylor manages to weave all of those characters in this emotional, gut-wrenching, visceral, violent road trip, uh, encompassing uh, essentially a what is uh, a, normally, a, I understand, a 33-minute drive from Bloodhaven to, to Gotham City, specifically the Gotham Gardens, where Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy have got up their have got their sanctuary set up that is protected by magic from the undead hordes who are, are blighted as a result of the crazy combination of the anti-life equation and uh, whatever Cyborg was. If you, if you recall the original deceased storyline, there was some perversion of the anti-life equation that gave rise to this blighting that created all these zombies that make people zombies through the internet. So if you're looking at your iPhone through your iPhone, any electronic device, you'll become blighted. Now, this uh, Deceased Unkillables obviously deals with these supervillains and how these gr group of supervillains uh, save a group of children in an orphanage. And the entire three issues is, is, uh, is about these uh, supervillains trying to save children. And of course, as I said, I just read out the entire cast there in an overgeneralized form. But when you got the cheetah and when you've got the creeper and you've got uh, Deathstroke and you've got Solomon Grundy and Bane and Lady Shiva and I mean, all these characters. And then you got the heroes of Cassandra Kane, you got Commissioner Gordon. I mean, you have uh, you have a, all these players that are into play, and and the children involved in this, and this how Tom Taylor masterfully plays this through the art of uh, artist is Carl Mostert, and his art here really does shine. Despite the fact that I had some issues with Carl Mostert's art art in the first two issues, I've really become accustomed to it, and it really heightens the sort of visceral impact of this series. So Carl Mo Mostert, Mostert is the artist. Uh, Trevor Scott does uh, the inks, uh, Mostert does some of the inks as well, Neil Edwards uh, also does the inks, and Rex Locus is the colorist, and the coloring really shines in this too, and he uses a lot of the color red because there's a lot of blood in this issue. God, it's visceral, but it's such a joy to read, and why is it a joy to read? How can such a violent comic be also a joy to read? Real simple, because interspersed with all the, those moments, those key character moments are emotional moments between the characters. What's incredible is that Tom Taylor, again, impresses me like no other. He seems to get the heroes and the villains now of the DC Universe in a way that I wish certain other writers, like Bendis, for example, and even Tom King, for example, and frankly, even Tom uh, Scott Snyder at times, would, that he would get. Tom Snyder just, or Tom, <laughs> Tom Taylor just has an instinct for this, uh, for DC characters, and man, it really shines here, and I'm happy to report, of course, that we also have a digital release uh, of Deceased Hope at World's End with, for only 99 cents on Comicsology. so check that out. That's 22 pages long. That's a hell of a deal. So between uh, between getting the Deceased Unkillables number three and the uh, Deceased uh, Ho Hope at World's End digitally for 99 cents, we're getting a pretty good deal here, guys. Now, uh, I said before, one of the, the impact of this series, the reason why it works so well is how Tom Taylor can almost, not almost, he makes you feel like you know these characters, even though you only meet them sometimes for a couple of panels or a couple of scenes through his masterful use of dialogue. And he just gets these characters. Right away, uh, we're introduced, uh, he sets the tone right away. You literally, this is, this is a self-contained issue. You literally don't even need to read the first two issues. All you need to know is that this is a road trip from hell. You, you're immediately introduced right off the bat. You're, you're 
Tom Taylor lets you know that hell has come to the orphanage. Right away, it shows an orphanage. It has 41 children in it. You got heroes, anti-heroes, and they got to rescue these kids. They got to get them from Bloodhaven it to, um, to the Gotham uh, Garden Sanctuary where Poison Ivy and Harley and other heroes are hiding out and Dr. Fate protecting with his magic. Well, that's, that's a problem, because this issue starts off with a bang, because right away, Bane has been turned last issue, and he attacks. Grundy, of course, takes out Bane in a visceral fashion. The orphanage the, is compromised, the security is compromised, so they get on these two buses, so we got these two buses. Uh, one of the buses is driven by uh, Lady Shiva with uh, Cassandra Kane, her daughter, on one bus with her delivering like 20 children on that one bus on the other bus it's it's the other bus is driven by uh deathstroke slade wilson and with Com and commissioner gordon is alongside him and then we have the batmobile being driven by uh red hood uh, jason todd and of course beside him is rose wilson slade wilson's daughter and so we got these three vehicles plowing their way uh, which was normally a 33 minute drive they could probably do it in 12 minutes but they're plowing through the army of the undead and there's so many obstacles that they that they run into along the way and of course you got loss of life you got violence and the heroism that shines through the way tom taylor <laughs> uh, writes uh, the hero writes the story it's just so, and the dialogue is just it really gets you you really this is an adrenaline rush this is like watching mad max on the big screen and kudos again to carl mostert the artist does a really good job. Now, what works for me is the emotional scenes uh, in between the violence. I counted them. There was a one, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There was at least eight emotional moments in this uh, in this forty some odd page comic book that just really seemed to have an impact. Uh, what one in particular was, uh, uh, and I'm just going to rattle these off. Uh, there's emotional impact between Cheetah, Cheetah. The, Tom Taylor introduces us to at least uh, uh, four children: Letitia, uh, Gareth, Zaid, uh, Zaid, and Matilda. Matilda loves the Cheetah, and Matilda herself, the way he describes Matilda, these are all kids that if they if they don't die, they're going to probably grow up destined to be super villains because these are kids that raised in an orphanage. They they seem to have they like the villains because the villains are protecting them. They like the super villains, and Matilda has an has an affinity for the Cheetah. She calls her uh, good kitty, and of course we know that the Cheetah is not a good kitty. But the relationship between the Cheetah and Matilda uh, is really something that that shines through in this issue and as tom taylor makes clear in his uh, scripting that you know nobody else can call cheetah good kitty uh, except for matilda and matilda herself was trained to strangle a pompous princess with her own golden lasso that's how he describes eight-year-old matilda <laughs> so uh then there's zade 12 year old zade who's a he likes to use slingshots there's seven-year-old gareth he likes true he likes tree lobsters and he's sort of a survivalist and he's a good runner then there's 14 year old Letitia. she knows how to kill a man in in six different ways with her hands so undoubtedly she was probably trained by Lady Shiva. I mean, there's all these characters where we just get snapshots as to who they are from Tom Taylor. And then, then you sort of move on. And there's other children, of course, because there's 41 children. We don't meet them all, but we. But Tom Taylor very wisely keeps one of the children. He doesn't reveal who one of the children actually is until the end. And that's his master stroke. So because we've always been wondering who the narrator of this series is. And there's been different theories as to who is the person narrating this series. Well, the revelation of who is narrating this series comes at the end. And it comes just at where there's the most tension. Just when you think all hope is lost. The person who is narrating this story ends up being uh, one of its uh, heroes and saviors. And the revelation is just fantastic. I'm not going to say who the narrator is, but it really, it nails the landing. That's what I love about this. It nails the landing. And Tom Taylor, to his credit, does just a masterful job here. Uh, great moments between uh, Grundy and the Creeper. The Creeper saves Grundy's life. Uh, when he's attacked, when Grundy is attacked by the uh, hordes of the blighted undead, and uh, the creeper says something that has relevance later on, he goes, "I can't let you die on a Monday; it would ruin your poem." And of course, a reference to the Grundy, you know, born on a Monday, did something else on a Tuesday, Thursday. I think the poem. I don't, I'm not sure. Does Grundy die on a Friday, Thursday, or a Friday in the poem, or does he die on a Sunday? I'm not sure. But in any event, 
Grundy uh, does end up having a particular fate in this issue, and even at the end, even though Grundy might end up dying on a Monday, it, uh, contrary to what the Creeper said, it doesn't in fact enhance the poem. It actually makes me want to Google and read the poem again. Thank you, Tom Taylor. You see Tom King? A rough, you know, Tom King, when Tom King puts a poem in a comic book, it doesn't inspire as much Googling as when Tom Taylor does it. Kudos, Tom Taylor. Thank you, Tom Taylor. I'm not mixing them up. All right. Um, so all these are on the, so we got these two buses in the Batmobile driving crazily, smashing through the undead, trying to get to the Gotham Sanctuary, Garden Sanctuary. And uh, we, we, uh, the chaos initially starts to happen because on one of the buses, Mirror Master ends up coming through a mirror. Some children are killed. The cheetah ends up t taking out the Mirror Master. Uh, chaos ensues. And uh, good emotional moments as, as cheetah interacts with Matilda. Uh, you, can, you can tell that Matilda, that the cheetah cares. And you can really see that it takes, a, I guess it takes a, an Armageddon, an undead Armageddon crisis to see maybe the softer side of supervillains. But Tom Taylor does a really good job here of writing that. And you really get a sense of that while, uh, while in the midst of all this action. And uh, we even get uh, good moments between Commissioner Gordon and Deathstroke where Commissioner Gordon says, we've lost enough kids today, Slade. You might need some help with your girl because Slade at one point wants to go back and save Rose, his daughter, because she gets lost sort of amidst the chaos. Commissioner Gordon says, no, I'm coming with you where I'm done losing children today. And so there's there's good moments like that. The heroism of Commissioner Gordon continues to shine, shine through. Commissioner Gordon has lost his daughter, Barbara Gordon. She died in issue one, I believe. So, But it just goes to show you a true hero shines no matter what the crisis. And Commissioner Gordon is really the heart and soul and the embodiment of that in this issue. Uh, but his, his, his example, uh, well, really is exemplified by all the supervillains in this issue and the the, the supervillains that that tragically don't make it well there's a nice little tribute of them a statue made of them at the end i won't say who the ones that die are but i got to tell you the the epic battles here when they because the true the true force that they have to face is the undead wonder woman who we know from the the first dc series wonder woman the undead wonder woman is still around and uh there, there's a fantastic scene where where Jason Todd and Rose Wilson are in the Batmobile and they're thinking they're pretty safe because the, you would think that the Batmobile is the safest vehicle to be in, certainly more than the two buses that the children are in. And they're sort of leading the way and clearing the path for the two buses. They're taken out by, by Wonder Woman. And in order to, and, and that forces uh, Solomon Grundy, the cheetah, and the creeper to confront Wonder Woman. And that battle is just, <laughs> you got to see that battle. It's just, it's really, it's really epic. And everyone knows, Slade Wilson knows that, you know, cheetah can't take on Wonder Woman alone. But uh, so the creeper goes to help and Solomon Grundy goes to help. And it's an, it's just a gut-wrenching, visceral battle. And, of course, it's inevitable that Wonder Woman will win, uh, but how she does that and the way that plays out and the scripting of that and the emotional moments that, that lie in between all the action, the way that just Tom Taylor transitions from the scene to scene and goes back at just the right moments is just masterful. There's a beautiful moment between, uh, one of my favorite moments is between Cassandra Kane and her mother, Lady Shiva. Now, I'm a huge Cassandra Kane fan. She's uh, my, my favorite character in the DC Universe, particularly her flat particularly her pre-Flashpoint uh, uh, incarnation. I'm less of a fan of the present Cassandra Kane as she is uh, currently being scripted in Batman and the Outsiders, but uh, I, I still, I'm still a big fan of her. I'm still her, uh, she's still my number one uh, character. And the moments between Lady Shiva, Lady Shiva, of course, loves Cassandra Kane. She actually tells her daughter she loves her. At one point even helps Cassandra Kane because she, she knows if she doesn't help, Cassandra Kane, of course, has that mindset, no one dies, she'll save everybody, she'll risk her life, and it frustrates her mother, Lady Shiva, <laughs> but she, so Lady Shiva goes out and helps her and says, I love you, just shut up and keep fighting, and uh, there's a wonderful moment, uh, well, actually, I say a wonderful moment, it's actually a horrific moment, but yet, <laughs> how Tom Taylor can create a horrific moment and an emotionally touching moment at the same time is just incredible. Lady Shiva... Uh, and uh, spoiler warning in this one aspect, because I got to, I got to, I, I have to spoiler warning about Lady Shiva. 
At one point, Lady Shiva is scratched by one of the undead, and she knows that she's only got seconds before she turns, and and leave it to Lady Shiva to go out on her own terms. She actually rips out her own heart, and she says before she does so, she tells her daughter Cassandra, "I always admired you the most." And it's it's about as emotional as is as Lady Shiva can get because she's not necessarily a touchy feely. Super villains are not touchy feely people, right? <laughs> so that's about as close you're going to get between a moment between Lady Shiva and uh, her daughter Cassandra Kane. Great moment there. There's also uh, probably one of the better mo best moments is a moment between uh, Deathstroke Slade Wilson and his daughter Rose, uh, where they're not huggers, but <laughs> and Tom Taylor just gets it. I mean, he knows neither. Anyone who reads DC Comics knows that Slade Wilson's not a, he's not an emotional guy. He's kind of, he's sort of like your typical cliche trope written character that he's, he's the tough guy that doesn't show a lot of emotion, but he loves his family. Uh, but he's not a hugger. And that's actually a, that's actually literally something that Tom Taylor actually scripts that it's right. The narrator basically said, I mean, they're not huggers by nature, but Rose, uh, Rose can see the future. Rose Wilson, his daughter, uh, she can actually see elements into the future and she could see no future where both of them survived and and so she she goes in for a hug it's a very awkward hug but it, it it's a perfect way of capturing the moment between these two super these characters these super villains that that really it embodies their character and tom taylor just gets it in so many ways the the i count at least eight emotional moments here between characters that when those emotional moments had occurred you almost forgot about the violence that preceded that moment or that will follow it that's how successful this comic is this is easily one of the best comic books i've read uh in the last in the last year in terms of just plain fun fun good characterization great action great character moments great emotion and and the art works artistically this works and the art never took took away from any of this. It actually enhanced it, particularly some of the more visceral, the visceral sort of the the, the liney action and the and the and the colorists by uh, 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 Rex Locus's coloring of this. Everything combined to really make this comic books just zoom off the page in a very horrific and beautifully emotionally impactful way. I just can't like I, I really enjoyed this. I'm. I'm trying to, I'm, I want to, I, I always have this thing where I got to say something negative, but is, I mean, I feel like I, is, did I like every aspect of it? Was there a perfect comic? Well, it probably wasn't perfect, but I'm re I enjoyed it so much. I can't think of anything that really bothered me about it. I just, re I really enjoyed it. I thought the pacing was fantastic. It was frenetic. It was fast. It had to be. This was a road trip from hell. It was just fantastic. It did a really, really good job. At the end, there was a, the reveal of who the narrator was was also emotionally impactful. And I'm not going to ruin who that narrator was, but let's just say whoever that narrator was, it, it worked because you never suspected who the narrator was until you got to the end and this narrator had to make a particular transformation after uttering a particular word and you never knew that this character was even in the story until the end, and she ends up ultimately having to confront this. This particular character has to confront an undead Wonder Woman, and because this particular character had previously been trained by Lady Shiva and some of the other supervillains in order to make her more powerful and more skilled, she was able to save the day. And ultimately, they, they at the end of the day, uh, while they are fewer in number, all the people that were on that road trip do make it to the sanctuary, the garden sanctuary in Gotham City. And this comic book works. I highly recommend this comic book. I, I love all the covers for it. All the covers are great. This is my favorite cover, uh, but this one's also really good. And then there's the other uh, one I didn't get with that uh, Deadshot. It's also a great cover as well. Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember who does the... Uh, uh, I'm not who does the alternate covers here. I'll read the names. The the variant covers are by Francisco Matina and Tasia MS. Yeah, Tasia MS. So this this is must be Tasia MS. And then for Francisco Matina does the other cover, uh, alternate cover of Deadshot. And yeah, this cover, this this the standard cover here is by Howard Porter. Uh, really great job. 
Guys, tell me what you think of Deceased Unkillables number three. I loved it. I thought it was great. It's what we need to see more of, quite frankly. And uh, I, I, I want more Deceased Unkillables. Unfortunately, that's the last issue. But we at least we have Deceased uh, Hope at World's End released digitally at, at every two weeks at 99 cents a pop. Great deal. 99 cents for 22 pages on Comicsology. Check it out, guys. And until next time, follow me on Twitter at Metropolis40 and hit the subscribe button. I note that my sub my sub count has been kind of like it's been it's been sort of steady. I get a couple, then I then I, I gain two, lose three. It's I don't know. YouTube's been crazy, even for my small channel. It's been weird. So just make sure you're subscribed if you normally do watch my channel. I appreciate that. And until next time, comic boom, out.